This episode of The Edge is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek.fm at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trek.fm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. You're listening to Trek FM. What have you done out there on the edge of Federation space? We're live from the internet. Hi, Woo. everyone. Woohoo! We're doing this again. We just keep trucking along, don't we? Uh, trekking along. Trekking I see along. what you did. We're just trekking along. So, yeah, welcome everyone. It's October 10th, 2017, and we have now seen episode four of Star Trek Discovery, which is my favorite title so far in the Discovery series, The Butcher's Knife Cares Not for the Lamb's Cry. Isn't that exciting? I think, Justin, you like that title, right? I, I love that title, and it's the second longest title in all of Star Trek, which is pretty awesome. So yes. I like that a lot. <laughs> I think I saw yes. you tweet that. That's why I mentioned it. Well, anyway, yeah. first of all, let's do introductions. I'm Bruce Gibson here on Live from the Edge, and Brandy is my co-host here with me. How are you doing? I am great because I'm not sick with the cold anymore. So, yeah. So you had a cold. You got a cold last week from doing the show. No, I was getting (laughs) sick while doing the show. So if that explains any erratic behavior that anyone noticed, so be it. But uh, the next morning, I woke up terribly, terribly ill. So it was coming on gradually, and then it kind of hit me overnight. And now I'm feeling much better, except for still a lot of sinus crap. But sinus crap. Yeah. See, this is why people need to watch the live show to see the hand movement at the sinuses. (laughs) Yes, because I'm constantly using my hands. (laughs) Well, we have a guest co-host like we've had the last couple weeks, and this one is Justin Ozer. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's great to be here. So happy to be talking Star Trek Discovery and to be doing it live. It's exciting. I've never done a live podcast before. Lots of recorded ones, but it's exciting to do a live one and to talk about uh, this episode tonight. Well, you know, Justin, you can't mess up because then we can't go back and edit it because I know. It's live. I know. <laughs> Yeah, what what people don't know who don't do podcasts, you can't go in and say, edit that out, edit that out, or just, you know, restart what you were saying. So, yeah, it's everything that uh, I say is going to have to be better than usual, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, then be. you'll be doing better than us. That'd be, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, we're just flying by the seat of our pants. Let's face it. We are. We are. And, and we're really good at it. Yeah, we fly by spore drive, too. <laughs> Well, there's spores everywhere. There are. <laughs> well, we want to thank everyone who's tuning in live and uh, for joining us. And so because we're live, we want you to participate with us. And the way to do that is three ways. You can send us a tweet and you can send it to at Trek FM on Twitter and make sure to use the hashtag live the edge. That's hashtag live the edge. And uh, we may read your questions or comments here on the show. So we want this to be very interactive. And then also, if you're in the Babel Conference on Facebook, we have a post of the show there. You can put your comments in there. So we'll be watching that. And also, because the live feed is on YouTube, there is a chat next to the video that you're watching now. So you can also participate in the chat. So that's a lot of fun. So we'll be watching you no matter where you are. And then we're going to read what you have to say. Well, I'm not going to say we're going to read everything everybody's saying, but we're going to read some of it. So again, uh, call us out on stuff. Ask us questions. Ask Justin how his day's doing. Whatever you want to do. And we'll go from there. Yeah, I've actually already had a comment from Trek001 saying, you had a cold? Have you tried Pulaski's chicken soup? (laughs) No, no, I haven't. But now I wish I had. And maybe it would have shortened the duration. 
So I wish I had known. Where were you a week ago? <laughs> I didn't know I was sick then. I didn't know I was sick then. It's okay. Can you get Pulaski's chicken soup at the store or does she have to make it homemade for you? You know, I'm going to guess that it has to be homemade because that's the best chicken soup, right? I Is the kind so. that's homemade. You don't think so? I, well, no, I say I think so. I, oh, you I, think I, so? I do think so. <laughs> but then okay, with Pulaski, then. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> I feel like we're recording an episode of Real Grey here. The oh. TNG stuff. <laughs> Why is that? Because we're off topic now? Oh, apparently Trek Zero Zero One was on Risa when uh, when I was uh, talking. Well, when I had a cold, but uh, but that's okay because honestly, Risa. It seems like someone's always getting kidnapped to or from or at Risa. So I'm not a big fan, really. Do you think we'll see Risa in Discovery? I hope not. No, probably not. <laughs> I really don't. I really don't think that's appropriate. Or maybe we'll see Pulaski. Necessary. This is an episode, a live episode of Earl Grey, and this whole episode's about Pulaski. <laughs> um, no. she wouldn't have been born yet. Right, that's um, true. Well, maybe she was. She was just very, very old by the TNG. But anyway, let's not. Let's. I digress. So let's talk about. Episode four of Star Trek Discovery, the butcher's knife cares not for the lamb's cry. I like saying that. It's just so much fun. And so this episode aired October 9th in the United States and Canada, and then today, October 10th, everywhere else in the world on Netflix. Bruce, so, it's still October 9th today. Where? <laughs> no. Oh, no. No. It's Today's, October 10th everywhere. No, you're right. Today is October 9th. Sorry. I'm no, reading October my notes 9th? Wrong. What is this? So the episode released on the 8th. <laughs> Today is the ninth. I'm so confused. That's okay. But, but by the time it's the it's because, fabulous it's because you were you were on the ship. The saucer was rotating around. It spun around. It got you a little disoriented, right? Well, okay. I'm glad you said that because <laughs> let me just say because we're reviewing the episode, there's going to be spoilers, and we're going to start that off right away. So I want to know from you guys. <laughs> yes, the ship it spins around on its spore drive. What did you think of that? Oh, I love that. I loved seeing it. You know, I don't think I had gotten a spoiler yet for why the outside of the, the ship kind of, it, it has this inner ring in this space and little spokes and an outer ring. And this explains it, why it kind of spins around. How that has to do with spores, I don't know yet, but I just loved it. And it was just a beautiful thing to see. And then to see it kind of corkscrewing around and darting off, I, I absolutely loved that part. Well, yeah, the thing is, I... Uh, you know, when it's on the streaming service, I can't slow it down. I can't do slow-mo because is it really – I mean, I know the whole spinning, but then when it's about to go off, is it really twisting and turning like it looked like it was doing? Or is that just some weird visual effect? I, I don't know. I, I took it to be that it's kind of twisting – that that the the the, um, the outer part of the saucer is spinning around, and then when it gets to a certain point, it allows it to, like, corkscrew around an axis. That's what it looked like to me, but – no, I haven't been able to slow it down to see for sure. But it looked cool nonetheless. It did look cool. What'd you think, Brandy? Um, at that point in the episode I went, <gasps> Take that all you people who were complaining about the design of the saucer section. It has a purpose. <laughs> so um I actually was really excited by that. It looked really fabulous. And uh the whole corkscrewing thing, I'm just kinda like, Yeah, well that's that's quantum stuff i'm just gonna write it off to quantum stuff so i don't understand everything about it i don't necessarily need to understand everything about it right now um but it seems like they are not i don't think they're wasting anything i don't think they're doing anything just for the sake of doing it so i'm looking forward to learning more about how that spinning saucer ring works and why i I liked it. I, I was I, I was the same way. I had a, a reaction verbally where I was like, oh, cool. Ooh, it, or whatever I was saying. It was just interesting. But at the same time that I thought about it, it was like, gosh, this show really is going in different directions that we've never seen in Star Trek. I mean, every episode that comes up, I'm like, oh, well, that's different. And, and at the same time, we've gotten so many weird different things that we haven't seen before that it's starting to feel... It's still Star Trek, but it feels so weird. It's different that sometimes it doesn't feel like Star Trek. Uh, do you? Does that make sense, or is it? Is that just me? <laughs> I, I I think it it makes some sense. I mean, I have to say, for me, I I really love the first two episodes. I had some issues with with the third one, which kind of 
in some ways didn't feel as much Star Trek, and this felt like a return to that. So I, you, I think it's natural to, to think about that because it's something new, it's doing something different. But I do see it as within the, the framework of, of Star Trek and that it's also kind of examining this corner of the Star Trek universe because I don't think it's representative at all of what's going on in the entire Federation at that point or on every ship. I mean, they say Discovery, I think, is the only one that has this spore drive and that, that is doing these things. Right. And Pike's Enterprise is out there doing something different with some different technologies. So I think this is like a little corner of, of that universe. And in that way, it makes even more sense to me because it's not like that everywhere, I, I don't think, in any way. No, this is unique to Discovery. I did pick that up, that this is the only ship in the Federation that can do this. And that's why they're on their own and wherever they spore to is that <laughs> they spore yeah. someplace if you can warp somewhere you can spore somewhere right 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 not yeah. spore well, factor four <laughs> i love that i want to see that um but to be fair the glen is constructed pretty much identically as discovery so until it they destroyed it uh, it, too, was capable of having a spore drive. In fact, they were testing right. the spore drive when the massive accident happened. So at least that's what I'm assuming, because the, te- the, the tardigrade was in the chamber in engineering mm-hmm. and busted out of engineering when this accident happened. And, yeah, then uh, wackiness ensues. We know what happened after that. But, uh, but yeah, it seems like the ships were designed almost identically. In fact, they were sequential because the Glen was 1030 and Discovery's 1031. So they were literally right after each other. I didn't pick up on that. I didn't see the registry number of the Glen. Yeah. Oh, I did. Oh, good. I'm a nerd. I mean, I think it makes sense. They, they. It, it seems like there was Stamets and Strahl, and there were these two scientists who were working on it. So it made sense to have two ships and have two separate ways of of doing it. So yeah, I think they just kind of rolled the two off the assembly line, or however they're doing it at at that point together. Yeah. Yep. Agree. And uh, honestly, I love having a different direction in Star Trek because. I know that people are comfortable with what they know and they want everything to be comfortable because they know it. But I'm one of those people that enjoys exploring new things. And that's what we're doing, because really, when you think about it, um, all of the Star Trek episodes, uh, excuse me, series rather, were focusing on one ship or one space station or... I accidentally activated Siri. Sorry, Siri. Um, so it's so it, we're, we are looking in each of those series at only one part of Starfleet, one part of the quadrant. And so Discovery is no different in that, but it's telling a much different story than what we have seen before. Yeah. And quite frankly, I love it. Yeah, and especially the fact that obviously these spores – aren't going to work well because we never see those again in the Federation. I mean, if, if, if the spore technology worked really well, then Voyager would not have been stranded in the Delta Quadrant. Exactly. And I think we're already seeing the reason why. Because that poor old tardigrade was not well after that big jump, which we'll talk about the big jump in a bit. But uh, and and Michael knew it. In fact, when they were activating the spore drive the second time and it was she she knew it was in pain and she was horrified. You could see it in her eyes. And I don't think that even with her ability to sometimes detach from her emotions, I don't think that she can let this creature be tortured. It's a sentient life form, you know? Yes. And I, and let we want to touch on the creature here in a moment. Uh, the YouTube chat we have Trek O O One, and by the way, he points out it is October tenth in the UK right now. So I guess I was kind of right when I said it's the tenth. <laughs> yes, and Australia. Yes, New Zealand, yes. etc. Yes. And so true. Trek O O One also says, why does the discovery? Why is it NCC and not an NX prefix? Since it is a prototype ship, that's a good question. It really should well, be an X. 
I don't know. I mean, the the thing about NX though is, you know, in enterprise we see the NX01, but that's because it's an NX class. I don't think it's because it's an experimental ship at that point. And for the NX designation was the first as far as when things aired was the first time that we saw that designation with the the Excelsior? Yes, that the, the first Excelsior place? Yeah. in Star Trek 3, right. In Star Trek NX 3, 2000. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's that's NX2000, but that's the first one we see which takes place some decades after this so i mean you could say maybe they don't have that kind of designation for an experimental ship yet but it's a good question i hadn't really thought about yeah i hadn't thought about either but it it definitely makes sense um i don't know maybe it wasn't and maybe i I don't know i don't know we can theorize all all day on that one maybe it's like a different area of starfleet that builds nx ships versus ncc i don't know and we may get an explanation sometime. I mean, it's just four episodes in, right? Um, and what I was thinking about today is we're four episodes in, and I was thinking about the first four episodes of TNG, which were Encountered, Farpoint, The Naked Now, Code of Honor, and uh, The Last Outpost, some of which are not very good. So, I mean, I think that you know, early on, it's hard to get a handle on what the whole feel of the show will be, but I think they're really starting out you know, strong, and they know what direction that they're, that they're going in, which is great. Yeah, and maybe some of this will be answered in a novel, too. But Sam Greenwood yeah. in the chat also says this is not a prototype ship, but a prototype engine. So maybe mm. that's the difference. Mm. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. Interesting theory. Hmm. Could be, I must say. Good point. Good point. Uh, also, well, let's see. We, we wanted to talk about Kitty Kitty. Is that Ripper. the next thing? Ripper. <laughs> Ripper. I still like Ripper. Kitty Kitty as the name, but Ripper. Yeah, Ripper's Ripper's not really appropriate either because it's not a predator. So I mean, if it was just really aggressive, but obviously it only gets aggressive when it's in when it's defending itself. Yeah, and yes. Michael proved that. Yeah. Now, is it is it Commander Landry or Landrew? Landry. 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 Okay, because times at the, certain times it sounded like they would say Landrew, and I thought it was Landry. It's Landry. Oh, it is. It is Landry. But okay. yep. So, yeah. Is uh, anybody upset about her death? Uh, do you want me to say what I really feel about Landry? <laughs> yep. Yes. Pl- no. I do. No, lie to us, Justin. Lie to us. <laughs> we want the truth. We can handle the truth. You know, like, so seeing her in, in the third episode and in, and in this episode, it seems like uh, she's a pretty one-dimensional character. It's It's just all about... Um, you know, doing everything that she can for for Lorca and the war effort, no matter how bad of an idea it might be, and you know, letting this tardigrade out and and trying to to basically um, kill it and chop off part of it is a terrible idea. I think she's a really bad security officer for that. And because they hadn't really drawn out the character too much, her death definitely didn't affect me as much as some of the other characters, like Georgiou, for example. So. Yeah, I, I I was okay with it. I know other people have really liked the character, were sad to see her go, but that one didn't affect me as much because I don't think they had put as much into that character as they have the the other ones. I agree because uh well, this is what my husband Dave said because she uh Commander Landry herself says that she, you know, her main job is strategy and tactics, but if that's true, she has proficiency in neither of those things mm. to take a gun and and uh, whatever else she had i don't even remember what it was something small and bladed yeah and just let that thing out i mean come on and it's it's interesting um to think about how everybody's like we don't care how it behaves well you should even if yeah. you're trying to weaponize something when you know its behavior you know what to think about it. You know how it thinks. You know what it reacts to. That is the first thing you should learn about any kind of alien life form is how it behaves. Even if you're trying to weaponize it like Lorca wants. That's just just skipping yeah. to trying to find out how to weaponize it. It doesn't work that way. No. There's a process to no, it. No, you should have been on the ship. You should have been helping Burnham convince Landry not to do that. <laughs> I totally would have. I would have punched her in the throat. That's what I would have done. Ooh, that's too violent for Starfleet. <laughs> so I, no, it's not. <laughs> I, I have a question. So, so that that implement she takes out uh, the you know little 
bladed curved thing. Was that like what you see in Enterprise, the Andorian like ice tool that you see Shran and Archer fighting with? I couldn't quite tell, but it kind of looked like that. It may have been. I don't know. It yeah. very well may have been. I would have to go back and compare. Because she, she, was, she was talking about lopping off you know, a part of it, and that's kind of what Archer does to Shran's, one of Shran's antennas. So. Well, that's true. That's true. So you may be right. Good call. I think you're right. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I don't <laughs> I'd have know. to look at it again. Because she doesn't get a chance to use it. She takes out the, you know, the gun and the, the curved blade and then just sets the blade aside and tries to you know, shoot it and doesn't work out. <laughs> so she doesn't even get to use the blade. Well, it seems yeah. in our chat that uh, Landry's death was something that was welcome and surprising to, <laughs> to other people in the chat. Yeah, I right. was actually surprised as well. I thought, oh, well, they'll just take her into sick bay and fix her up. And oh, no. Oh, no. A little she's, shake of the head. She's dead. Yeah, She's dead. Oh, I was shocked, and, too, because I heard, uh, I don't remember where, if it was after Trek or on a podcast or something, but someone said, oh, you know, if you didn't like her in episode three, She's a very good actress. She's going to do more with the character. You'll, you'll learn more about her. And then they killed her. <laughs> I was like, yeah. What? <laughs> well, and the the funny thing is, is that the actress who plays her, I know she's a great actress. I've seen her in other things, and I feel like she wasn't given enough to do with this role. Um, even if it's somebody you're only going to have for a couple of episodes, just still establish that character or or give us something to hold on to. Because I found her pretty much repulsive in almost every way as far as her attitude towards people in general and Michael especially. So I just, you know, it was one of those things where I'm just like, see ya, wouldn't well, want to be ya. And it's a good thing that they didn't have that creature on the Enterprise D because Pulaski would have probably been dead by now. <laughs> If certain people had had their way. <laughs> mm. uh, but, you know, it, 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 it feels like, you know, they're, they're doing these things with, with certain characters, with Burnham and Saru and Lorca and the Tardigrade and, and, um, and Tilly and, you know, Klingons and all this stuff. I don't think there was room enough to develop Landry, it seems like. And all the plot points they wanted to do, it just seemed like that got kind of squeezed a little bit. Yeah, I can see that. But uh, to make your chief of security be so reckless, I think, was a mistake. Yeah. But at the same time, she was interpreting Lorca's orders the way she saw fit. And she mm -hmm. obviously thought it was the right thing to do. Well, joke's on her, I guess. Yeah, but you're right. She's carrying out Lorca's orders, and I think that's what he wanted. But he doesn't want anybody to be stupid when doing it <laughs> exactly yeah, because the only exactly. thing that, that got done was she got killed so that didn't help <laughs> nope it sure did not help no it but... didn't so yeah. uh trek 001 says maybe landry is pulaski's great 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 grandmother okay so anyway we'll okay. move on <laughs> 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 well, speaking of death, uh, you know, we lost one of our favorite captains that we've only known for a short time, Captain Giorgio. And uh, we got to see a little bit about her and learn about her death. Um, she, I don't know, this is kind of hard to swallow when I think about this. Uh, <laughs> if you know where I'm going, uh, we have Renee on Trek on, on Twitter tweeted us at Trek FM saying, uh, did the Klingons eat Giorgio out of desperation, or was it a ritual? I'm going to go with desperation, because I don't think that's their normal behavior. And in their conversation, it seemed like it was something that they did because they were starving, and not necessarily because they wanted to eat a human. But that's my personal yeah, opinion. Definitely one of the most gruesome images glad they didn't show anything of that <laughs> oh it's perfect that they didn't show anything yeah. because our imaginations are far worse than anything they could have put on screen right yeah, yeah. I, I almost had a picture of indiana jones and the temple of doom with the monkey brains the chilled monkey brains mm. maybe something like that or hannibal or something anyway that's it's i shouldn't probably even go there right now but but what was nice was her will yeah. um Burnham didn't want to open her last will and testament, so she shoves the unit under her bed, 
And then we get later in the episode and Tilly's like, well, you know, you're so strong and you've faced so many terrible things. I would think you'd be able to handle this. And it was nice to see Captain Giorgio's image, uh, her uh, message to Burnham. It was bringing her back to the show in a sense. Yes, and I still think we're going to see more flashbacks in the future because how could they not? I mean, Michelle Yeoh is just, she's perfect in every way. And so I don't think, I mean, I just, my feeling is that we will see more of her in flashbacks in future episodes. I've said that before, and I'm doubling down on it. Yeah, I, I, I hope so, because I I really love the, the Giorgio character, and Michelle Yeoh is, is so great. And it was it was great to see her even as you know a hologram in this will at the end of the episode. I just love the last part that that she says, you know, take good care of yourself, but most importantly, take good care of those under your care. Amazing! I I, I love that so much, and it was so well written what she was saying. And I definitely hope we get you know flashbacks or some other way that she can be involved because. She was only really in there for a couple episodes, but she's one of my favorite Star Trek characters. I just, I just love how she was portrayed and everything that she did. Really, isn't that amazing? She's one of your favorite Star Trek characters, and she was only in two episodes. That's that says a lot, right there. I think it says a lot for the performance, and it's one of the reasons why I really love the first two episodes a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, she made this this big impact in those in those couple of episodes for me, and I think for a lot of people. I've seen a lot of people on Facebook and Twitter say that they love her. She's their favorite captain, and all this stuff in a couple of episodes. That's quite an impression. Yeah, it is. Um, maybe maybe a spinoff. Uh, Sam Greenwood in the chat mentions maybe it's time for a spinoff. I'd love that, or at least a bunch more uh, Shenzhou novels like David Mack. Did recently well i think that the yes. bridge set of the shinjo is still uh in the studio from what i've heard so maybe okay. they can still use that and maybe it's there for flashbacks but still if it's there maybe they could do a spin-off series or or mini movie of some type or whatever mm-hmm. for for cbs all access do you mean have a prequel to the prequel wouldn't that be I enterprise think that's what it would be <laughs> 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 because basically showing uh, stuff on the Shinzo would be a prequel to Discovery, which is a prequel to the original series. Yes. So it's like it's like nesting dolls. It's those Russian nesting dolls. A prequel within a prequel within a prequel. But it's in our future. So it's weird. How can it be a prequel if it's not even happened yet? Because it's a prequel to events that we have witnessed in the future, and I could explain more with quantum mechanics, but then we'd be here all night. Well, if you can explain that, we should do a different show later. <laughs> yes, quantum realities. That's a fun topic. Yes, it, it is. I mean, I'm not being facetious. It's a fun topic for me, but it makes other people's brains melt. I like it. Quantum stuff is really, really weird. <laughs> I know. That's why it's so much fun. You're like, this cannot be real. It's much, this is, it's this much is real. It, like what happens at the quantum level is much weirder than anything you could ever put in a Star Trek episode. It really is. But, <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> well, I want to remind uh, people again, if you want to send us a tweet, send it at Trek FM using the hashtag live the edge, or you can ju- join us in our YouTube chat, which seems to be pretty active right now. So there's a lot of conversation going on maybe it's more interesting than what we're saying i don't know (laughs) (laughs) maybe so what about klingons now you know vok we didn't get to really talk about on the live show two weeks ago um we did not so this is our chance to do that because he's returned and uh things are really stepping up for him Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We finally get back to the Klingons in this episode. And I I don't know why I'm saying finally, because there was really only one episode without them. And uh, and we see what's happened with the sarcophagus ship in this interim. And I did not expect them to be sitting there dead in space in the battlefield. Uh, that is just not what I expected at all. Yeah, I and thought I thought, well, that's interesting. The ship would pick them up or something. but <laughs> You would think so. It's like they all came together for this fight, and then they all went their separate ways and just left but you know what? the I, person I, I, behind who started it all. Yeah, now, I mean, now that I think of it, maybe it's kind of like this is where Takuvma was killed, and it's like a holy site that they need to watch over. 
and they also want to see what they can do to put the ship back together and get the cloaking technology. I, I guess it could make sense, but it did strike me as a little strange that they were still sitting there for months and months. Well, it makes me wonder, did the houses just abandon them, that they just didn't believe in him anymore, that, that Takuma, yeah. Takuma has died? That's basically it, yeah. is they're just like, oh, well, you guys succeeded and all, but... You know, we're not going to stick around to help you or anything well, because they, they the had, battle's over. And they had also, you know, pledged um, their loyalty to Takuvma, who's now dead. <laughs> so I don't know how things would work in that Klingon culture. But I, well, I, Takuvma did name uh, Vok as his successor. Yeah. So what's the big problem there? If they were so fastidious about being loyal to Takuvma, then why not? Transfer that same loyalty to Vogue. Well, Cole does for a while, but I, I don't know what's happened in the interim in like the last six months <laughs> that they're just yeah. letting him sit there. Who knows? Maybe we'll get an explanation of it. But, yeah. um, but I thought I, I thought that was rude to just leave him there. But but I really loved seeing the the Klingons in this episode. I know some people have had some some issues with it, but like every minute that there are Klingons on screen speaking Klingon, I'm just like riveted to it. I I love it in so many ways, and I have to say we've talked about uh, Vok, who's you know the supposed to be the new leader, but the one who really made an impression on me is Laurel, played by Mary yeah. Chifo. Like mm-hmm. what what she was doing. Like in her acting and especially in her eyes, her eyes were like so expressive of what was going on in her mind and what she wanted to to say more than just her words. I was just amazed by all of that. I was like, wow, this is some incredible stuff here that she's doing. And she only had a little role before it was much bigger in this episode. And I hope we see a lot more of her. Oh, I think we will, especially considering how the episode ended. Yeah. So, but yeah, Laurel, oh, Yeah. I was I was sitting through every scene with her in it, and I was just going, "You go, girl, you go, yes, yes." And even when she appeared to turn against Vogue, I knew that she was planning something else. I could see it in her eyes. Well, yeah, and those eyes—they seem to insinuate that there may be some love interest between the two. But is she playing? Oh, I Vogue? saw that. Is she playing it? Does she really like him, or is she playing him to use him as? her means to get power later it's hard to tell if she was using him then she would had well, she would not have left cole and transported onto the shinzo with with vogue who was left there to die so yeah my my opinion is that she really does have a thing for him and if he's not stupid he will have a thing for her too <laughs> so you know you're you're stranded in space what you gonna do do they still have a working holodeck? <laughs> let's, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I was just, I was so Im- impressed by that, uh, by the performance that, that she was giving and everything that, that, that she was like saying beyond her words. Uh, yeah, I can't say enough good things about it. Yeah, she is so committed to that role beyond oh, yeah. what you normally see with any role, really. I mean, she just... She embodies that character in a way I don't think we've seen for a while in Star Trek. Um, well, you know, because it's been 12 years since we've had new Star Trek uh, as far as the series. But she, uh, she's, she's definitely a standout for me. And I was waiting for her to get more screen time because I just remember her stories about being in the makeup chair and she had her Klingon dictionary and she would be running her lines and she wanted to nail it. And good Lord, she did. Yes, she did. I agree. I mean, I, I really liked her, and I'm also liking Cole, what uh, mm-hmm. little we've seen of him so far. This episode really featured him uh, quite a bit. Um, I think it's really going to be interesting to see Vok and Cole kind of go at it eventually, and I, th- I just feel like Terrell, I mean, Laurel is going to be like right in the middle of that and maybe playing them both. I think she's the one who's going to mm-hmm. be the ultimate power in this when we get to the end. I guess yeah. we'll see. I guess we'll see. Sounds right. I just don't know what to think yet. But who knows where it's going, really? And that's one of the things that's exciting. You don't quite know if that's what's going to happen or something else. There's a lot of stuff I don't know. They keep surprising me with stuff. I mean, come on. I'm like, it's like I keep, my head keeps spinning like it's the Discovery about to go into Spore Drive. (laughs) 
But I love that. Don't you like being surprised? I, I do. don't want all of my Star Trek to be the same. That's like listening to the same song for the rest of your life. I mean, come on, let's have something different. And that's what we're getting. I know. It really does make my head spin. It's like I, the next day I'm sitting in the car driving to work thinking like, oh, you know what? I want to go back and watch that. Oh, wait, you know, to consider. And I'm just like, it's just playing with my head. It's so awesome. I, after 50 years of Star Trek that we can still have that kind of reaction to something new is incredible. Yes. Especially in this day and age where everything seems to have been done. And I'm seeing things that I've never seen before. Yeah. So. Yeah. And Daniel in the chat says that the producers wanted to say that they know that the show diverges away from canon and it'll be revealed why and how it all connects to Prime Trek. Um, so he's asking us, do we think that they really have a plan? I absolutely do. Mm -hmm. I absolutely think that they have a plan because it would be folly to start any of this stuff that they've shown us so far without knowing how it's going to end. So I am fully confident that they have a plan and that they are executing it. And I'm ready and willing to see what they have next. Yeah, there have been some interesting comments. And there was one from uh, producer Akiva Goldsman recently where he it may have been the article you were referencing, Bruce, where he was saying that they're they are aware that there are these apparent deviations from canon and they're going to work over time to get it toward what you see in the original series 10 years later i'm thinking oh they want like 10 seasons to do that okay <laughs> but i'm down with it yeah but, but Let's yeah do 10 i think seasons. but but i think also like you know the, some fans have have reacted that this is something that's really different. It can't possibly fit in. But we have seen so many times in Star Trek where something fits in that you didn't think it would. Like, you know, even the, the Klingon look that you see in the motion picture and, and forward with the, the, the ridges, that wasn't explained for 35, no, not quite 35 years, 25 years, I think it was, until Enterprise Season 4. That's a long time. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, even if they get into some of these things and, and explain them within a couple of years, that's fine because there's, there's a lot of room to do that. We're looking at a certain corner of what's going on in that universe. Not everything is going to, to look or feel like that. And so that's fine for me. I'll just watch it unfold and see how they do it. Well, it really does expand the Star Trek universe because I think a lot of us fans go in knowing what we know from all these other series and it's like, okay, this is Star Trek. This is how, well, this is what Klingons are. This is how Starfleet is, so on and so forth. And we may just be touching just a small part of that. And there's such an expansive, I mean, if anything that this series has done for me, it's just really expanded the thought of, wow, there could be other ships out there testing other technology we've never seen doing you know, weird, weird looking designs that would be to us of the ship and maybe even again, different uniforms. I mean, there could just be all kinds of branches of Starfleet we're not even aware of. Yeah. And I think, Agreed. I think there's, there's, you know, so many different possibilities for what's going on in the Federation, because I don't know if it's been established how big it is in the 23rd century, but in the 24th century, it's hundreds of planets across thousands of light years. There's so much that's going on in that wide expanse that we've never seen. So I think there's just you know, limitless possibilities for where they can go or, or what they can do because it's such a, a large universe that they're really working in that we've seen the tiny, tiny corner of. Yeah, I agree. Well, this is, this is kind of the way that I explain it. If aliens visited our planet and they based their opinion on only what they saw from our world leaders, how would that make us feel to be judged by their actions instead of our own? So I feel like, yeah, um, go ahead and do something different. And I'm going to hang on and enjoy the ride because there are infinite amounts of stories that can be told in this universe that's been created. And, hey, bring them all to me. I'm game. Let's do it. Yeah, that's true. It's not like, you know, if aliens landed, you know, in Europe and then landed in Asia, they'd say like, wait, these people look different from what these we saw before. Humans. Th th this can't be canon. <laughs> oh, no. exactly what i'm saying that's exactly the kind of comparison i'm trying to make although, and hope, you just although did it hopefully better. those aliens would come from a you know a planet or a system where there were different cultures there'd have to be right so they wouldn't have the expectation either i think that they'd be getting something just from landing in one place i would hope <laughs> you would think that but then you know Hopefully, I, I would hope that the human race would also feel the same way about the Star Trek universe. You know, it's not all going to be the same. It's not all going to be 
all pretty and、uh, perfect, and this vision of the future that it's a utopia, you know. And and we saw fractured areas of that perfect utopia in Deep Space Nine. And so I really, honestly, don't know why people are so upset about Discovery. I'm just kind of like, you know. We've kind of been a little bit down the dark path. Now we're really going down、uh, in, into a more a darker area, but it's still Star Trek. Yeah, and it, I mean it's never been perfect. I mean, in, in TOS there were lots of you know bad morals and and people doing all kinds of stuff within the Federation that you know the crew of the Enterprise had to combat or do something about. It's not a perfect future. I see it as a better future because it does seem better and something we can aspire towards. And Discovery can still do that because they're still working within the framework of a better future. They're in a darker corner of it in a lot of ways, but they are still in that better future. And their goals, like their overall goals, even if we don't agree with their methods, sometimes are to support that better future. So it it can totally work for me. It's not perfect, and it's never been perfect in Star Trek from the very beginning. I mean, yeah, it sounds like my marriage. I mean, it's it's. I love my wife, but you know, it's not perfect. But anyway, oh my god. Oh, Bruce's wife. I am so sorry. Don't worry, she doesn't <laughs> listen to this. If she did, she'd be perfect. Um. <laughs> oh, no, I'm、I、kidding!、See. I'm sorry. Wow, I see.、Uh, no, of course I know,、um, but yeah, I agree. But s- things aren't interesting because they're perfect. There's interesting. There's interest in the imperfections.、Um, like I was making a scarf for my husband, and I am really good at crocheting. But for whatever reason, the way I decided to do this, I kept screwing up and accidentally adding. Or decreasing stitches and not realizing it, and I told him,、oh, "I'm gonna just have to start over, because this is just gonna be all uneven." And he says, "That's okay. The imperfections make it beautiful." Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's a good analogy. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, perfection isn't even possible. You know, I, no, I, I, I say sometimes like. If it's perfect, it doesn't exist. It's just not possible. But you can aspire towards certain ideals to to do something better or to improve. To kind of always strive for that perfection that's impossible to achieve. But in doing that, knowing yourself better and you know bettering your life and hopefully the life of those around you in the world. That's that's the best you can do. And and in Star Trek, you know, even in Discovery, they're part of this this world where they're trying to examine things and and try to do things. Better and to improve, even within this difficult situation. So I think it it very much conforms to what we see, you know, in other parts of of Star Trek. We're just seeing a different part of it. Justin, if I said that's a perfect comment, does the comment exist anymore? No, you just made an inaccurate statement. That's all.、Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we we would like you to、anyway. thank you for joining us on Metatrex today. No, that was a good <laughs> comment.、There. Wow, I have so, to think about. No, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so,、uh, so we have some people in the chat mentioning again. We've heard the theory about Section Thirty One, and maybe that's why the Enterprise and some others and us watching Star Trek haven't heard of Discovery and these technologies because this is actually Section Thirty One. Do you are you coming around to thinking it's Section Thirty One? Do you believe it's Section Thirty One? I'm not sure that I do. I don't necessarily think it has to be Section Thirty One to be classified. So well, the other thing is, you know, just because we haven't heard about this before doesn't mean it's classified or it's secret. It just hasn't come up. Like in the course of the episodes and the things we've seen. It either hasn't happened yet, Enterprise or the Cage, or if it's after that, it's just not something that would ever come up for anyone to to be like, you're visiting a planet. Hey, remember that spore drive that we used to have a hundred years ago? I mean, like <laughs> that. That's the way I think about it because we're not seeing everything that's happening in all of these periods of time. It's it's a slice. It's an episode or a movie or whatever. So that we never hear about it doesn't bother me at all because、yeah. you're not seeing everything in Federation history. And I don't think it, it's it's part of Section Thirty One. It's just a new technology. But related to that, one of the things that I found really interesting was in Episode Three, Lorca seemed to be this dangerous guy who seemed like like he was doing something bad. 
And then, you know, you come toward the end of episode three and it's a new way to fly and it's not trying to weaponize things. And then in this episode, he was basically, you know, just being a wartime captain. I didn't see him as a bad guy in this one. It gave like a different side to him. I don't know. What did you guys think of Lorca in this one? I I kind of saw him as like um, a cranky, disapproving dad for the most part, especially when he was running battle drills on the bridge. And then he's just like, OK, you're all dead, you know, and, and uh, he tells Saru to start it again. And they're like, we'll do better this time. He's like, well, you could hardly do worse. You know, that's just very <laughs> it's very kind of parental to me. Yeah. But I mean, we've seen yeah. captains be like that and be disappointed and want people want them to do better you know even Picard or Cisco so I liked him better this time around I would say yeah. that episode three that we first met him in I did feel like there's something a little dark or something off about him and that still still may be true but in this case uh he felt more like a captain who has an assignment that they have to go into battle and to test the, test this technology to make some of this happen. And he's just very focused. He's got a mission. He's got to get the crew ready and we need to accomplish what we're sent out here to do. Mm-hmm. Well, and not only that, but he also knows the best way to motivate his crew in any particular situation. And in this case, what he did is broadcast shipped wide, ship wide, the uh, last transmission from what is it, Corvus Two? Is that the Corvan mining colony? Corvan Two, I think. It Corvan is. Two. Yeah. I I was close. Uh, so yeah, I almost had it. Almost. <laughs> I wasn't looking at my notes. Uh, and so he play he plays that broadcast ship wide, and it affects everyone. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was brilliant, and I was getting choked up. But then I'm a very emotional person. It doesn't take a lot for me to get choked up, because you know I got choked up when the the tardigrade was in the reactor chamber and uh, and was hooked up to that machine and was obviously in pain and so i i was getting emotional f- from that so that's just how that's how i operate all of my senses are at f- warp 10 basically and there is no off switch it's spore 10 spore 10 sorry spore 10 <laughs> that's a fun word spore 10 spore 10 <laughs> it could be your twitter handle now I have to, I'm going to have to just keep changing it. It was going to be Takuvma 12. Now it's going to be Spore 10, and people are going to get confused. But that's okay. Keep them on their toes. Is it just me, but when I hear them talking about spores, I think of Spock and this side of paradise <laughs> getting mm. shot by the spores. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. I think about I that I hadn't really time. either. <laughs> But you know what? While I was watching this episode and seeing the tardigrade, I was thinking, if it was Spock there, would he be mind-melding with this creature? Absolutely. Probably. <laughs> he would absolutely be mind-melding. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good point. Yeah, because I guess Burnham, even though she grew up on Vulcan, she's not Vulcan, so she couldn't necessarily mind-meld. And I don't know if we've... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know if we've seen anywhere in Star Trek that anyone can initiate a mind meld that isn't either Vulcan or have a Vulcan Katra within them. Right. But she does have a piece of Sarek's Katra. Good True. point. Hmm. So maybe, maybe she that's didn't. Good for... Well, maybe she sensed something because you know she seemed very trusting when she went in when she lowered the field and she was bringing the spores in. Uh, well, she she is very observant and very curious, and I think she was just using the scientific method at that point because she saw the way it reacted when the spore drive was powered up the first time, and she had already deduced that it was only uh, just from its characteristics and looking like a giant water bear that it was not a predator. And so she was testing her theory, and she was very confident in what that would turn out to be, and she was absolutely right. Well, and I have to say that there's something interesting to me about Tilly, because she comes across very sweet and innocent, naive, and I'm a cadet and whatever, and I feel a little uncomfortable around people sometimes, whatever, da, 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 da. but yet when she got on the Glen, she was all there for full force in the last episode, and then in this episode... When Burnham lowers the shield, Tilly just stands there in the room, knowing what has just happened to Landry. I mean, I would have been like, here, Burnham, here's the spores. I get what you're trying to do, but I'm out of here. I would not be standing there. No, and that's the great part because she says, you know, 
I heard that transmission, and I cannot help those people, but I can help you. And man, that girl, I just love her. I love her, and she surprises me in every episode with the things she does, the things she says, the way she says them, and I just think she's beautifully written, and I think Mary Wiseman just brings the character to life beautifully, and yay for redheads! Love redheads. (laughs) Because you're a natural redhead, aren't you? I am a natural redhead. I know you can't tell now. That's a long story, but uh, I was born a redhead. Justin, are you a redhead? You know, interesting that you ask because when I, I think shortly after I was born, I had a little red hair that fell out and then got more dark brown hair. So (laughs) for a couple days, I think, (laughs) one of those weird things that happened. So I guess I could say I'm an honorary one, maybe. Sure, Um, (laughs) absolutely. You just, uh, God decided to give you a soul, so he took the red hair and he gave you brown hair because apparently... Redheads don't have souls. Yeah, that joke never gets old. Boy, I've never heard that one. Me either. Anyway, I'm sure you've heard really? it. Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe I've been like, sheltered from those those cruel things. But You are lucky. <laughs> but, but no, I like when I first saw Tilly in the last episode, I was like, is this going to get, you know, a little annoying? But I think there's a lot to her, and I like her more every time that I see her. And I think it's true. Like, when, when she's given a task and needs to do something, she's competent. In that scene with Burnham, she's fearless about it. And she also takes the risk to steal those spores and take them to, to Burnham. So, like, in the personal interactions, you know, there's this awkwardness or this difficulty. But when she has, like, a specific task to do and knows what she wants to do, she can just go and do it, which is really interesting, and that makes her more a three-dimensional character. I, I'm liking her more. Yeah, I can't wait to see more from her, and I think her aspiration of becoming a captain, I th- absolutely think she can do that. I do, too. I think she's going to, going to come out of the series as one of the most favorite characters from fans. Hmm. Um I agree. And and even Stamets wasn't a jerk. Not that I really thought he was well, a know, jerk. Well, you know, it's interesting because he I always... He's a jerk. He's just sarcastic. And he's, he doesn't yes. like being there. Well, he's sarcastic and he's looking at the captain like, you are screwed up. You know, you're out here for battle and I'm a scientist and, and, and I'm not really all for this. And he's looking at Burnham like, and, you know, you're... You know, I, I don't trust, like, he's looking at everybody like, I don't trust you, I don't trust you, I don't trust you. But did you see how he changed with Burnham when he really found out that she knew what she was talking about? Oh, exactly. yeah. He, exactly. He, he listened to her, and he wasn't even a- angry at her for stealing the and, spores. And what I, what I like was that, you know, he was listening to this, and you'd see his facial expression, like, change, like, hmm. Hmm. Yeah. But he didn't even say anything. You could just tell from his expression that he's gaining the respect. And I think that they're going to, to work together a lot more on the scientific aspects of what happens on the show. I think he, she's gained his, his respect where before he thought that she was this terrible mutineer who started this war that drafted him, him into this terrible thing. So she's starting to be redeemed in his eyes, which is, which is really cool. I think what we're going to see is all of a sudden the crew starts to really respect Burnham and she has a great relationship with everyone except for Saru still. Like they'll always have this relationship where he still just doesn't trust her or doesn't think she should be where she is in her position. Uh, No, I think that's that's going to change. Of course, I'm projecting ahead to something that's very hard to predict, but I think something's going to happen somewhere in the season that she does something that that's important to Saru or saves his life in some way and, and actually gets some respect and friendship back. I think there's a longer arc there of them kind of um, coming closer. I don't think it's going to be that kind of cold relationship for the whole time. I do agree with you that I think that they'll get closer. I just think maybe they'll get close. It'll take them longer because remember they've served together for seven years and I think she'll True. quickly turn the rest of the crew around to her, and Saru just takes mm. longer to get there. But, you know, according to what I've heard, you know, episode eight, I think it's episode eight, is a good Saru episode. Just yep. be ready. <laughs> well, I, the impression that I get is they were never friends, ever. 
in that entire time that they served together. And granted, I've only read the first two chapters of the David Mack book, and I can't wait to finish it because it is great. But uh, just in those first two chapters, I'm like, oh, my goodness, that explains so much about Saru. Yeah. I get it. Yes. I get it. <laughs> and so and and how he overreacts, completely overreacts when she asks him to come down to uh, where she has the the tardigrade and, you know, she's talking to him and she even says, I can see that your threat ganglia aren't active. So this is obviously not a predator. And he gets all kinds of bent out of shape. He and feels like he's being, he's being used and she was being nice to him just for the purpose of using him to test her theory. I can, I can understand why he gets bent out of shape about it. He's being manipulated. I can understand that too, but I, I feel like she had to use the preface of, you know, talking to him. Well, she didn't even tell him why she, why she needed him. So it's not like she lured him with false pretenses because she just told him that she needed him down there. And so he came. And then she chose to, you know, explain to him that she felt she had treated him badly, which she did. She yeah. did. She really did. And uh, and he took that as a sign of manipulation. And well, I don't she necessarily also says, think that it was. She, she admits that it's necess- it's been necessary for her to be contrite. I thought that was her saying that, admitting to him that, you know, she needed to do that in order to to get him there and to test her theory. I don't know. It's it's a little uncertain for me, but that's how I took it. Yeah, I definitely yeah, took it I she's took- playing him. She's using him. Yeah, I didn't. So I guess we'll see. But uh, I don't I don't think she was using him in the way that he thought she was using him. Uh she, yes, she needed his help, but I don't think that she did it to be mean no, to him. I agree with and you. that's the way he took it. Yes, I agree. I don't think she meant to be mean. I think she just did it because it was logical. She needed yeah. his help and this is why she she brought him down here, but you know, no offense. You know, hey, I just, you know, why are you taking it so hardly, Saru? I mean, I like you, kind of. <laughs> well, it's think about it this way, though. If she had contacted him and asked him, I need you to come down here to see if your threat ganglia go off, do you think he would have gone? No, and it wouldn't no. have worked because he would be anticipating it. Like, she needed but, him yeah. without but, expecting But you know what? Here, here's the thing that I think about after having rewatched it today. Did she need to do that? She pretty much knew that she was right that that this thing wasn't really a predator. And this was like her final confirmation, but I don't think it was necessary. She was like 95% of the way there. Did she need to do that to be 100% of the way there? I don't know if it was necessary. I don't think if it it was necessary for her, but I think it would have been necessary to convince others. Hmm. Because not everybody, uh, almost nobody trusts Michael. That's good and. Point. Yeah, so I don't think okay. I think that she did that to back herself up in case anyone's just like, why should we listen to you? Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And she can say, well, Saru was down here and this is what we found out. Boom. So uh, we've just got a few more minutes. So are there any final oh, thoughts about this I, episode? Well, I have something I wanted to talk about. Yes. <laughs> Go right ahead. So, so Dr. Culber, played by Wilson Cruz, yes. I loved seeing him in this episode, if only briefly, and can't wait to, to see him more and to see his relationship with Stamets that we've heard of. So I was excited about that, even though it was a short little bit. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> in unison. And also Admiral Cornwell, I liked her that she wasn't a bad moral. So it was nice to see that in an admiral. Yeah, I actually uh, recognized that actress almost immediately. And unfortunately, the first thing I ever saw her in was Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter Dead, the Babysitter's Dead. And she was the cranky, I'm going to use the word cranky instead of the word I want to use, older sister of the guy that the main character was interested in. And she was just horrible in that mm. movie. <laughs> she was, I mean, she she played the part beautifully, but I'm like, hey, it's that one chick. But yeah, no, I really like her. I've seen her in many, many things and uh i was happy to see her on discovery awesome and real quick we have a tweet uh from laura at zero o laura o zero who's asking about the rankings of command science and ops they're gold silver and bronze is that in the same earth tradition as first second and third so is command first science second ops third is that what those uh colors mean you think hmm Oh, you mean if they're like Olympic medals or something? Almost, yeah. <laughs> I hadn't thought about it that that way. Command I, makes like sense. On the, 
yeah. Yeah, command, because what is it? Is gold, gold for command, yeah. silver for... Science. Science, officers, etc., and maybe bronze for enlisted? I don't know. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, you don't think of the same kind of ranking with the, the gold, blue, red on the original series, but... Yeah, that's I true. just I don't yeah, know. Gold, that's silver, true. I don't know. So so but but shouldn't there be like a platinum division for like the really, really important stuff? <laughs> like for the, the admirals. admirals. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> or the president right. of the Federation or something. I don't know. <laughs> something. So again, okay, yeah. so final thoughts, last few minutes. Justin, what what'd you think of the episode as a whole? Well, I I love the episode as a whole. I thought that you know, things are, are starting to settle in. We're getting to know the, the crew more. We're getting to know the, the characters more. We're understanding what's happening with the, the, the tardigrade and how it can help out. Um, I mean, in a certain way, it's setting things up. But for me, this felt like a really exciting episode. We get to see the, the ship in action and a lot of, of you know, things moving this, the story along and a lot of great stuff to think about. It was great to see Giorgio. I mean, I just loved... So many of the aspects, probably except for for Landry, who just made a really bad mistake. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, I, I I love it. I'm just looking forward to you know continuing to see where they go with things. So I know that you were talking about saving this for the live show, like I was. So what was your favorite moment? My favorite moment, oh. um, you know, it would it it's it may sound a little bit weird, but the opening i loved so much where they had like the lightning and all of this stuff going on and it turned out to be the synthesized uniform and maybe it's weird yes. to say that that was like my favorite moment but that surprised me so much i was like are they out in space is this a storm what's going on i just thought that was really creative you know even though there were so many great moments with the the ship and the spore drive and all the character moments that we've talked about but that first one i, I just love that they opened it with that what about you oh well, okay, I'll go with what I uh, haven't talked about yet. But uh, overall, I loved the episode. Won't miss Landry. Sometimes I feel like they created her just for us to hate so that we would cheer when she died. I don't know. But uh, I think it was exciting. We learned a lot. Uh, the characters were expanded, and I can't wait for more. My favorite, and even though this is completely telegraphed, and I knew it was coming, I knew it was coming. Everyone knew it was coming. But when Discovery just appeared at Corvan 2 mm. and just immediately destroyed two of the Klingon ships, I was like, yes! It was just that kind of a moment for me. Yeah, that was a great moment. I would say my... I, I probably have a, two, uh, a tie for my favorite moments. One is what we discussed earlier is hearing... Corvan to over the audio speakers and just seeing the crew, you know, hearing that and, and feeling the emotion of it. And the other one was just Samets and Burnham when they're watching the tardigrade and the spores. And just like I was saying earlier, just seeing Samets like kind of turn around and, and you see that, that side of him where he actually seemed happy for once in, in the episodes. And it's like, I think when I first watched this episode, I, I didn't like it as much as I liked three because I'm really hoping to like this crew better, but then I rewatched it again and I'm starting to see, I saw it better the second time of how the crew is starting to really come together. And I feel like that respect is coming to Burnham and I want to see more of that over time because I really want to like these characters and every episode we'll get to learn more and more about them. And I'm really looking forward to that aspect of it. Yes. So, and real quick, I want to give a plug, uh, Literary Treks, episode 206, we have author David Mack on talking about the Discovery novel, Desperate Hours. So, if you read the novel, I really encourage you to listen to that episode. There's a lot of good insight in there. And if you're not planning to read the novel, but just want to know what the novel is about and some of the inside baseball stuff that came with that in the show, it's definitely worth a listen. So, check that out. It was released... Uh, this past Sunday on October 8th. Yes, I got the date right this time. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. And you know, I since I am reading the book, I'm saving that episode until I'm finished with the yes. book. If you're so reading it, do that. Listen. Yes, wait, don't. Yes. If you're reading the book, wait, re read, finish the yeah, book. Yeah, because you guys listening. got into spoilers real fast on that one, I was noticing. <laughs> yes, and we called that out too. <laughs> you're like, oh, wait, yes. hold on. Oh, uh, yes. Brandy, didn't you have a shout out that you wanted to do? 
I do have a shout out. Uh, I'm shouting out to my friend Simon Lindy DeLuca, who is in Montreal, Canada. We have uh, befriended each other. Um, so we're, we're about the same age as well. And he is, uh, French speaking. So English is not his first language. And I, for that reason, I think he communicates very, very well for not, for saying he doesn't know English very well. But, uh, he has been great to talk to about Star Trek in general and Star Trek Discovery and many, many things that we have had conversations about. So Simon, uh, I know that you've been to the ER after cutting your finger tonight. Wow. So uh, thumbs up to your sort of thumbs up that you sent me just a few minutes ago. Wow. So hope you get better soon. Yes. Get better. And he had to get it. Yeah. He had to get a tetanus shot. And oh, those things are so painful. Oh, they hurt yes. forever. Mm. So I'm so sorry, Simon, but you're awesome. Okay, so I got to do the stuff that we do at the end. Yes, I was of just going to mention that. Why don't you edge? read it to, uh, to Simon? Is like a. I'm I'm so okay, Simon. <laughs> listen carefully. All right. Be sure to check out our discovery coverage throughout the week. Live from the Edge airs on Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern. You're watching us right now, and will be released as a podcast on Tuesday mornings. Our commentary will be available as Tracks from the Edge on Wednesday. We'll discuss your feedback on Postcards from the Edge on Thursday. And, of course, you can catch full analysis on the Edge main show on Friday. And to wrap up the week, join us for Notes from the Edge on Saturday for links between Discovery and the broader franchise. If you have not listened to that, I really recommend it. It is really interesting. Chris does a great job. And so you'll find all of these in the main feed for The Edge and in the Trek FM Master Feed. And we would love to hear your thoughts on Discovery. The best place to do that is the Babel Conference, which is our listeners group on Facebook. And Amy Nelson will collect your feedback for postcards from The Edge. You can also find us on Twitter at Trek FM or send us an email using the contact form on our website at trek.fm forward slash contact. Choose to send to a show and choose The Edge. And at this time, we'd love to thank our associate producers, who are Norman C. Lau, Tony Robinson, Thomas Paleo, Lisa Slack, and Shoab Mirza. And if you'd like to help us keep all of our shows going and even become an associate producer, visit patreon.com forward slash checkfm for all the details. I hope that makes up for how I butchered that the last Oh my show. gosh, you did so great. I was just going to say, you know, again, live, we can't edit and it was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. I'm usually very good at reading stuff. Just not last week. Well, because you were getting sick and you didn't know it. So that's that's the excuse yeah. we're going to run with. And hey, anybody who's uh, watching, listening live uh, and you like Star Wars, go check out the new trailer. It just dropped a few minutes ago. But, you know, just wanted to throw that out there <laughs> since I do a Star Wars podcast also. So, Justin. And yes. Yeah. What, Brandy? That's good. No, I was just going to say, Star Wars and Star Trek, better together. There was actually a panel about that at Salt Lake Comic Con, which I ended up not being go able to go to oh. because I had a low blood sugar attack and Larry Nimichek was on the panel and everything, and I'm really sad I missed it. Oh, wow. I would want to see that, too. But it, it sounded so awesome, and I'm sure it was because Larry was there. I, I don't really get to hear Larry talk about Star Wars, so that would have been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. All right. Well, then, Justin, where can people find you online? Well, you can find me elsewhere on Trek FM, uh, co-hosting Earl Grey. That's our dedicated Next Generation uh, podcast. I co-host that with Amy Nelson and Richard Marquez. We have a great time talking about Next Generation every week. You can also find me on Twitter. I'm at TrekFan4747, where I tweet about nothing but Star Trek. And you can also find me hanging around the Babel Conference, which is our listeners group on Facebook. Yay! Well, I definitely listen to you on Earl Grey, and it's been a pleasure knowing you, and you've been on Literary Tracks, and I saw you in Vegas. It's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for coming on. And Brandy, where can people find you? Oh, you can always find me lurking in the Babel Conference. I say lurking because I don't always initiate posts, but I sometimes comment on them. People have tried to start arguments with me, and I just, I don't argue, and I think that that frustrates me. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, well, we'll have to agree to disagree. 
because that's just the kind of person I am. But uh, yeah, you can find me there. I'm on Twitter as Brandywine12. That's B-R-A-N-D-I-W-I-N-E-12. And uh, I also have a podcast that I do with my husband called The Dark Corner Podcast, which is on uh, strangeanddeadly.com. And uh, like the name of the website suggests, we tend to look at things from a bit of a darker perspective. And for some reason, our coverage of Salt Lake Comic Con has been the most downloaded episode that we have ever done. And I have no idea why. Mm. Congratulations. Whatever the reason is, that's good. <laughs> I hope it's because I got new listeners from Trek FM. That would be lovely. But keep in mind, it is not for children. Uh, there is swearing. You swear? I swear. Okay. So, so much. It's, it's ra- so it's, much. It's rated MA then, like, like yep. Discovery. <laughs> <laughs> yep. For mature audiences only. <laughs> Wow. Well, you can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex, where I'm not swearing. And you can find me talking Star Wars on the Star Wars Report at StarWarsReport.com with Riley Blanton and Mark Herleman, where I'm not swearing. And you can find me here on the network on Trek FM on Literary Treks with Dan Gunther, where I'm not swearing unless we have an author on and we turn off the microphones and there is some swearing going on. And... Because we like to swear. No. And then uh, you can, of course, find me in the Babel Conference lurking around just like Brandy does. And sometimes I post things. So there you go. So I, I have a new way to sign off if, you, if I can indulge in that. Oh, please. We're a live show, right? Absolutely. Uh, live. Sh- <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Take two. Live, long, and prosper. <laughs> Oh, nice. Nice. Live long and prosper. (laughs) Bye, everybody. Bye.